Welcome to Not Two Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Scripting the Change Selected Writings of Anuradha Gandhi Emergence and Consolidation of Feudalism From around the 6th century AD and the early medieval period, the caste system, based on jatis, began to consolidate in most parts of India. It is clearly linked to the rise of feudalism all over India, when a class of intermediaries was created which expropriated the surplus in the form of revenue or share of the produce from the laboring masses. This was accompanied by the development of the self-sufficient village economy. The decline of trade in artisan guilds, primarily due to the collapse of the Roman Empire after the 3rd century AD, the contraction of money circulation, the settling down of artisans in the village, created the conditions for the rise of feudalism. Land grants began to be given to Brahmins, Buddhist monasteries, and to army officials. Though this process began in the Satavahana rule in the 2nd century AD, and with the Guptas in the 4th century AD, it became widespread from the 5th century onwards. From the 7th century onwards, appointing feudal intermediaries who collected revenue and took on administrative tasks became common. The distribution of land grants to Brahmins in the period of rising feudalism meant that from the beginning they consolidated a part of the feudal class. This process essentially took place between the 5th and the 7th centuries, especially in the parts that were colonized by the migrating peasant settlers, in Bengal, Orissa, Gujarat, and central and western Madhya Pradesh, and the Deccan. It began under the Pallava rule in the 6th century in the south, but reached its peak during the Chola rule from the 9th century onwards in Tamil Nadu, parts of Karnataka, and the Kerala regions. In this period, the proliferation of jatis also began. Jati, originally a term used for a tribe with its own distinct customs, coming into a varna, gradually replaced the varna, since it became the main organization in which people were bound together. The original peasant settlers emerged as specific peasant jatis in particular regions. In the south, the dominant peasant landowning jatis were considered as sattvic shudras, ranked only next to the brahmins. A number of jatis and upajatis, each with an occupational specialization necessary for agriculture or for social life in the village, also developed. The carpenter, blacksmith, potter, tanner, skinner of dead cattle were available in the bigger villages, as also the barber, the washerman, and the priest. They provided their skills to the peasant and other families, including the families of the feudal intermediaries. In return, they began to be given a share of the village produce. Initially, the share was decided by Natar, the association of the dominant peasant community. In later times, the shares became more formal. They were also given the right to till a part of the village lands. The judge money system, the balutedari or ariyagari system, emerged within the new arrangement of the village structure. Money was not needed for daily exchange. This arrangement greatly aided the Brahmins and the upper castes from the landowning, feudal intermediaries, to raise their ritual status and social prestige, since the lower castes were available in full complement to do all various types of physical and menial labor. The upper castes did not have to soil their hands. The jati system was suitable for the feudal mode of production, and it would not be wrong to call this jati feudalism. It is in this period that the number of untouchable castes swelled greatly. From the 4th century BC itself, there are references to the untouchables, in Patanjali, for example, who mentioned two types of shudras, the nirashit, excluded, and the ashrit. But their numbers were restricted. Gradually, newer tribal groups began to be included. But it is in the feudal period that their numbers went up greatly. The chamars and rajaks, for example, were reduced to the untouchable status of an untouchable. Tribal groups, subjugated by force after being dispossessed of their forests and lands, means of livelihood and freedom, 
were relegated to an untouchable status. Some artisan groups, too, were pushed down from the Shudra to the Ati Shudra ranks. They were in the main bounded agricultural laborers who were denied by religious injunctions any right to own wealth, gold, etc., and land. Their only dharma was to labor for the entire village, especially for the landowning class, but live outside the village at a distance, polluting even by their shadow. Maximum surplus could be extracted from the untouchable laborers, forced into a low level of material existence and perpetual servitude. Brahmins, both as individuals and as groups, were granted lands and a share of the revenue from the villages. They lived off the surplus created by the villagers. The Brahmadeva villages in South India became the centers for Brahminical culture and learning. In these villages, Brahmins combined their control over the productive resources with administrative control over the life of the village and the surrounding region. Brahmins were allowed to keep the revenue of the villages, or the larger share, Melavarin, of the total produce. They got their lands cultivated through tenants or sharecroppers. The Dharma allowed them the right to own land. They could supervise cultivation, but they could not cultivate it themselves. A section of the Brahmin castes were closely associated with the rulers. Apart from providing fictitious genealogies to prove the Kshatriya status of the ruling groups, they were the royal Purohits, and in many kingdoms, they held administrative posts. These Brahmins, who helped to generate the surplus, gained the highest social prestige in the feudal era. As landowners and revenue collectors, closely associated with the rule of the kingdom, the Brahmins held wide authority in the political, social, and religious life. They were active members of the feudal ruling class, and its ideologues as well. At the same time, in this period, the Kshatriya Varna consolidated itself in northwest India. This process did not take place in the south. The class of feudal intermediaries, as also big landowners with feudal armed retainers who lived off the land grants and share of revenue, became a permanent feature of feudalism. In the north, the ruling or powerful clans of those invaders like Gujars, Hunas, and Arya Kshatriyas, and the intermediaries consolidated to form the Rajput caste. The clan-kin connections of these groups from the feudal strata were consolidated through marriage alliances to form the Rajput Jatis. The word originates from Rajruta, one who controlled a few villages in the early medieval period. In this period, the village headman also came to be recognized as an important post. Normally large landowners from the dominant peasant caste, they separated themselves from their cultivating peasant castemen and consolidated their position through kin relationships and marriage relationships among themselves over a region. The Reddis in Andhra Pradesh, from Pedarettis, and the Gaudas emerged as separate caste groups through this process in the medieval feudal period. The process of the consolidation of the Jati structure was completed in the main by the 10th century, before the raids of Muhammad of Ghazni. The feudal class upheld the Chatuvarna. Even rulers who professed Buddhism were proud upholders of the Chatuvarna. This scheme provided a ritual status to the various Jatis. All castes connected with physical labor, peasants, artisans, or those that challenged Brahminical superiority or the notions of hierarchy, kayastas or court writers, Vedas or doctors, were classed as Shudra. But since this scheme was unable to explain the multiplicity of the various jatis, the Varna Samkara theory was put forward. This theory explained the various jatis as being a result of the unsanctioned marriages between men and women of different Varnas. The Manusmriti, 1st or 2nd century AD, proved to be a harbinger of the feudal order that emerged, providing it with a perfect ideological justification. This theory was nothing but the justification for the superiority of the exploiting classes and provided sanction for the lack of freedom and degradation of the majority. It is often claimed that untouchability arose as a result of the ritually polluting nature of certain occupations and their low value. However, the nature of occupations cannot create a class of permanently polluting people. The ideology of ritual pollution and purity, on the contrary, provided the means of creating a class of semi-slaves for the agricultural and urban economy. As a ruling class that controlled the land and labor of the exploited classes, 
and in the condition of strong resistance and sharp class contradictions, Brahmins, as active members of this ruling class, developed the theory of pollution and purity. For this, they may well have borrowed from tribal terms, with the Brahmins themselves as the reference point to measure purity. The occupations became polluting. The ideology of Varna became the ideology of the whole society, which shows the importance of the caste system in the feudal mode of production. The significance of Brahminical ideology in the generation of surplus, in the legitimization of rule, and, above all, in the consolidation of an agrarian village economy based on intense exploitation, gave it hegemony over Buddhism and Jainism. Buddhist and Jain centers had become centers of opulence competing for royal grants. Though these religions too had changed to suit the feudal order, and they too accepted the Jati system, their role in the economy declined. They remained as ideological centers counter to Brahmanism, in spite of the fact that they were hounded and violently suppressed by various rulers, especially after the 7th century. With the invasion of the Turks at Sarnat and Nalanda, Buddhism could not recover in India from this destructive attack. Turkish Invasion The establishment of Turkish power in North India, through the slave dynasty in the 13th century, marked an important phase in the feudal mode of production. They centralized the administration and introduced a more systematic system of revenue collection. The composition of the ruling class underwent a change. Initially, it was the Turk slave families and their relatives that ruled. They were successfully replaced by ex-slaves of Indian origin, Indianized Turks, and foreign immigrants, to be replaced by even more foreigners. The most important changes were related to the methods in which the rights to revenue collection, ikta, were assigned. Originally restricted only for life, on the decision of the king, by the end of the 15th century they were made hereditary. The Turks were urban-based and favored Islam. Thus, Turkish rulers displaced the original feudatories and created new ones over a period of time. The administrative changes introduced by the Turks, and adopted in the Deccan too, introduced changes in the powers of revenue collection and administration, affecting military service holders, administrators, village headmen, and the priestly class. The office holders came to be called Inamdars, Vatandars, Iqtadars, Deshmukhsdesais, and later as Jagirdars, during Mughal rule. Although some of the early intermediaries who had lost their posts regained them during the later part of the Turk rule, in this period, the composition of the feudal classes in North India was not stable. However, this did not affect the structure of the village economy. The Turks introduced new techniques in the science of war. They also gave a fill-up to trade, commerce, and artisan production in the urban areas. Hence, this period saw the development of the productive forces in Indian society. Although the same instability in the feudal ruling class did not take place in South India, the emergence of the Vijayanagara kingdom in the 14th century, a militarist rule, also brought changes to the ruling class. The Vijayanagara kings owed the success of their rise to power to the military techniques they had introduced, which they, in turn, had learned from the conquering Muslims. They were allied with a class of warriors, called the Nayakas. These Nayakas emerged as powerful intermediaries over the older local chiefs. They were granted Amaram tenures, the right to a major share of the produce in the land, in return for maintaining an agreed number of troops and animals, ever ready to join the war along with the forces of the king. From the 14th century onwards, these Nayakas also became a part of the feudal class. Both the Vijayanagara kings and their feudatories patronized the temples and the Brahmins, and Brahminical Hinduism remained a very important part of the legitimizing ideology of the Vijayanagara kingdom till its decline in the 16th century. Tribal Kingdoms In the later feudal period, various tribal kingdoms came up. This denotes both the differentiation emerging within the tribes and their Hinduization over the centuries. The Dome founded a kingdom in the foothills of the Himalayas in the 13th century. The Bhars came to power in Assam in the 13th century and ruled up to the 18th century. The Nagbanshis and the Cheros ruled in Chotanagpur and Palamu in the 12th century. 
the Gonds founded kingdoms in central India between the 15th and the 18th centuries, the Mahadev Kolis founded a kingdom in South Gujarat in the 17th century. As these tribes settled down to agricultural production, they were influenced by the technologically and culturally advanced Brahmins, and peasants settled in the areas through land grants. Inequalities within the tribal societies grew. In the tribes in which a small clan made a push for power, kingdoms emerged. Although some of these early kingdoms opposed Brahmanism in their initial phase, and some of them worshipped both Hindu and Buddhist gods, all these tribal kingdoms were active supporters of Brahminical Hinduism. They invited Brahmins to settle in their kingdoms, attracting them with generous land grants. They also got genealogies prepared to claim Kshatriya status. Within the tribal kingdoms too, the ruling elite adopted Varnashrama Dharma to legitimize their power before their own people and before neighboring kingdoms. A lot of these tribal kingdoms later became intermediaries of more powerful rulers, such as the Mughals and the Marathas. Resurgence of Trade and Commodity Production The resurgence of trade and commodity production by artisan groups began around the 12th century in South India and a century later in the North. It led to the strengthening of the traders and artisan groups all over the country. The temples became centers for the growth of towns. Military encampments and administrative towns and ports developed as urban centers. The result of this was the assertion of the artisans and the trading castes to break out of the constraints of Brahminical control. In South India, the rise of the left-handed caste association, the Idangai, was the most powerful expression of the process. From the 12th century onwards, the artisan castes, especially those connected with urban trade, came together as the Idangai. Through this association, they defended their rights against feudal agrarian domination and the oppression of traders. The right-handed castes, the Velangai, tended to represent the agrarian castes and came from the low castes. As the putting-out system developed for the production of certain commodities, the conflicts between the traders and the artisans dependent on them increased. In North India, members of the artisan castes converted to Islam, for instance, the weavers, the julahas, etc. Protest The Bhakti Movement The growth of commodity production and the political and cultural changes created the material conditions within the feudal society for the rise of protest against the caste system. The caste system, with its emphasis on Vedic learning and Brahminical superiority, faced its next major blow in the form of the Bhakti movement. Spanning a period from the 12th to the 17th century, the Bhakti movement was a popular opposition to the caste system. Most of the Bhakti saints were from the artisan castes, like blacksmiths, carpenters, weavers, although a few of the religious reformers were also Brahmins. A few, like Nandan, Anayanar, Tirupan, and Alvar, Chokamela, and Santaravidas, were from the untouchable caste. The movement also brought women saints into the limelight. The Bhakti movement had a moderate stream, represented by the likes of Ramanuja, Gyaneshwar, and Chaitanya, which stressed the oneness of all before God. The more radical stream, comprising of saints like Basavana, Tukaram, Namdev, Kabir, and Guru Nana, criticized caste discrimination and Brahminical hypocrisy openly. Some of them initiated measures of social reform as well. Kabir and Guru Nanak went out of the fold of Hinduism. The movement, by emphasizing the personal relation of the individual with God, transcended the barriers of caste. It struck a major blow at the concept of Brahminical superiority based on the monopoly of the knowledge of the Vedas. The Bhakti movement was a major assault on the ideological and material premises of feudalism. Preaching in the local languages, it gave an impetus to the regional languages, laying the basis for the growth of nationalism in the different regions. Even though, towards the end of this movement, a conservative trend also came up in the form of Ramdas and Tulsidas, who upheld the Chatuvarna and sought the re-establishment of Brahminical superiority and prestige, in the main, the Bhakti movement was a movement for religious and social reform. The movement, however, failed to break the caste system. 
The main reasons were that the movement did not attack the base of the caste system, the feudal mode of production, and the land relations therein. Agrarian Economy and Ruling Classes in the 17th and 18th Centuries The Mughals who came to India in the 16th century from Central Asia consolidated their rule by associating with the Rajput chiefs and other upper caste intermediaries and their ruling groups of kingdoms annexed to North India and the Deccan. Thus, throughout the early period, though the Mughals monetized the collection of revenue to some extent and also increased the exploitation of the peasantry, they did not basically affect the social structure of the agrarian village economy as it had evolved over the previous centuries. It consisted of the intermediaries at the top of the rural structure, who were also, invariably, large landlords themselves. Often they held a post from the ruler, which gave administrative responsibilities and powers. There were also village chiefs and village-level officials like accountants. These office holders and feudatories lived off the revenue collected from the peasants. They also controlled lands which they got tilled by either tenants or sharecroppers. In some areas, they used the bonded laborers from the tribal or untouchable castes. Most of these feudal intermediaries were from the uppermost castes, Brahmins, Rajputs, and even if they originally came from the Shudra cultivating class, they had elevated themselves to Kshatriya or to a high non-Brahmin status. In some areas, they had even acquired Brahmin status. The control of temples had given the Brahmins wide control over the resources of the agrarian economy in the south. The appointment of Brahmins to high administrative and military posts during the Vijayanagara rule further concentrated power and resources under their control. In western Maharashtra too, the Maratha rule concentrated economic and political power in the hands of the Brahmins. The main cultivating castes were exploited for revenue and innumerable taxes. Yet their rights to the land had evolved over the centuries, even if they were under the feudatories. The judge money, Balutadari system, institutionalized the system of exchange between the services of the various castes and the peasants and the landlords. On the one hand, it formalized the share of the various castes to the produce, but on the other, it increased the power and prestige of the feudatories and Brahmins, and formalized the system of bigar, forced free labor. Higher caste landowning sections could withdraw from all manual work, especially work connected with agriculture. The other castes served as their judgments. It included free labor for a number of artisans and service castes, who served various families at the same time, but the untouchable castes were in many areas attached to a particular family. While specific untouchable castes in specific regions served as lower-level functionaries, watchmen, general servants making boundaries, relaying messages, etc., of the administration, and for this they received the right to cultivate a small portion of the village lands, the vast majority of them were agricultural laborers. They have been called as bonded servants, aristic slaves, and landless serfs. Their religious prescriptions suited this structure perfectly. While it was a sin for the higher caste to touch the plow, untouchables could own no land nor acquire any capital in the form of wealth. Other prescriptions, like style and type of clothing, names, carriage customs, etc., served to emphasize their degraded status and reinforce it. In many parts of the country, the names for the untouchable field laborers highlights this situation. Laborers in South Gujarat are called Halis, those who handle the plow. In UP, they are called Halvalas, Holias, and Sevaks. In Punjab, Halis and Sepis. In Kerala, they were the Adimas. Bondage was widespread during the time of the Mughals. According to estimates, more than 10% of the population comprised of agricultural laborers, most of them in various forms of bondage. In the beginning of the 19th century, in the southern provinces, this proportion was even higher. Almost all of them were from the lowest castes of tribals. The British colonialists inherited this structure when they began their rule. Pre-British Role of the State in Upholding Caste
given the repeated attempts by the oppressed castes to reject the caste system, to oppose Brahminical tyranny, it must be emphasized that the pre-British feudal state not only upheld the philosophy and ideology of relations of caste, but also actively intervened to maintain it. The feudal king had the authority to intervene in caste disputes, even those related to ritual superiority. Expulsion from the caste or readmission, decisions on rights of particular castes to ritual practices and modes of worship, were decided by the political secular authority. Muslim rulers, too, arbitrated in these disputes. The Vijayanagara kings, the sultans of the Deccan, and even the Mughals arbitrated in these disputes. For the state, this served the purpose of punishing subjects and also gaining financially. They collected fees for arbitration. But more important is the fact that since the feudal rulers depended on the caste system, they had to maintain it. The rulers had the right to extract free labor, begar, from the artisan and service castes, as also from the untouchables, especially for public works. The ideological use of the caste system was clear. It upheld and legitimized the dharma of the rulers to wield power. The growth and consolidation of the caste system was, therefore, not a spontaneous process, but linked to the support and power of the state. The caste system was upheld with violence. Brahmanism, in addition, sanctioned violence by the uppermost castes against the untouchables. They had the right to kill the untouchables who in any way transgressed the limits. The caste system was maintained not only through the ideology of the religion, but also through the sword. The Varna system and the caste system, having been such an important aspect of the socio-economic and political life of ancient and feudal India, much of political and economic activity was organized on caste-kin basis. Hence, a large number of social and economic conflicts were expressed in the form of conflicts between castes and religious sects. The conflicts between Buddhism, Jainism, and the Brahminical sects, the conflict between the Shaivites and the Vaishnavites, the struggle between the right-handed and the left-handed castes are examples of this. Since caste permeated the economic and political structures, it has taken this form to express the contradictions in the society. Tribals in India, too, have had a long, glorious history of attempts to fight the feudal order served by Brahminical Hinduism. The struggles of the ancient Naga people, the Nishads of the Bhils, against those who ousted them from their ancient lands, their resistance to attempts at Aryanization, the forcible incorporation to the agrarian economy as semi-slaves, are all part of this history. It is in this background that Brahminical Hinduism, in all its Shastras, Smritis, and even in the epics, depicts the tribals who resisted in the most insulting and demeaning language. Iklavya, for instance, was the son of a tribal chieftain. Brahmanism destroyed all the literature of the ideologies that opposed it, from Charvaka to Buddhism. The literature destroyed in India could only be found preserved in the monasteries in China and Tibet. This distinctive quality of Brahminical Hinduism has been hidden under the veneer of Ahimsa and abstruse philosophy, and thousands of years of exploitation and parasitic existence could be justified under the clock of ritual superiority and contempt for manual work. The Impact of British Rule Colonial rule did not touch or tamper with the Brahminical Hindu order and the inequitable caste system. The East India Company, in fact, gave a fresh lease of life to the Chatuvarna system by incorporating it into the legal system being used in India. By passing local customary and caste practices, they upheld the Dharma Shastras, appointing Brahmin pundits to advise the British judges in interpreting the Shastras and disputes relating to family and marriage, property and inheritance, and religious rights, including the status of specific castes. Hence, the British legal system upheld the denial of entry into temples to the untouchable castes in the name of protecting the established rights of other castes. The British courts entertained caste claims regarding privileges and precedents of exclusiveness and respect to religious rituals as well. In the name of respecting the autonomy of castes, they upheld the disciplinary power of castes against violators of caste norms, even in inter-caste disputes. 
Thus, they upheld caste, although in a much more restricted sphere than in the feudal period. The early British rulers encouraged and financed the study of Sanskrit and the translation of Sanskrit texts into English. One section of the East India Company administration even attempted to make Sanskrit the medium of instruction in the universities in the system of education that they were setting up. It is another matter that the direct colonial racist interests were upheld when English was chosen as the medium of instruction. Under pressure from the non-Brahmin movement and the reformers, the British were forced to enact resolutions and legislation granting access to public places, tanks, schools, wells, etc., maintained out of public funds, to members of all castes and classes, but they did little to oversee their implementation. Yet, at the same time, the British administrators, in their selfish interest of seeking support for colonial rule, implemented the policy of divide and rule, encouraged the conversion of the lower caste to Christianity by missionaries, and propagated the racist theory on the origin of caste, emphasizing the Indo-European origins of the Aryan race and caste as a means of maintaining racial purity. From 1901 through the censuses, the caste backgrounds of the people were recorded, and castes were classified on the basis of social precedents as recognized by native opinion. Through the censuses, the colonial rulers provided the various castes with a rallying point. The castes, which had started organizing themselves on a regional basis through caste conferences and caste newspapers, started mobilizing to record a higher status for themselves. The colonial state came to be seen as the means of raising caste status. The process of Sanskritization was aided by the British government. The economic changes introduced by the colonial rulers in the 19th century in order to consolidate their rule and intensify the exploitation of India had an impact on the relations of production in the rural areas and created new classes from among the various castes. The commoditization of land, its accessibility to members of all castes, the various revenue settlements, the Zamindari, Rayatvari, etc., the introduction of railways, defense works, the colonial education system, the uniform criminal and civil law, and the colonial bureaucracy affected the caste system and modified its role in society. In the land settlements, the British ignored the inalienable rights of actual cultivators, and in many areas made the intermediaries, the non-cultivating sections that only had a share in the produce traditionally, become the sole proprietors of the land. In the Zamindari settlement areas, the Shudra peasants became tenants at the mercy of the landlords. In other areas, a class of peasant proprietors arose. But, even in this, the larger peasants gained while the actual cultivators became tenants or sharecroppers. The Shudra peasantry was divided into an upper section of the rich, intensified exploitation coupled with famines and other crises, indebted peasants of all the cultivating castes who were pushed into the ranks of the landless. A section of artisans became landless laborers. A class of rural poor, landless or poor peasants, emerged from the ranks of most of the middle and lower castes in the 19th century. A working class linked to industrial production also emerged from the ranks of the middle and lower castes. A small section among the lower castes also found avenues for mobility with jobs as small contractors, traders, and investors in land. With access to education, service in the army, and the government bureaucracy, a class of petty bourgeoisie also developed within the middle and the lower castes. But they found their avenues blocked by the monopoly of Brahmins over the government jobs. The introduction of Western education helped the Brahmin caste to monopolize the colonial bureaucracy. With their tradition of learning and their socially and economically powerful position, the Brahmins and others from the higher castes took Western education and soon came to occupy most of the posts in the administration and judiciary. The development of new classes among the non-Brahmin castes led to the growth of a democratic consciousness among them. This was reflected in two processes. Among the upper section of the non-Brahmins, for instance, the Kayastas in the north and the Nairs in Kerala, reformers started organizing caste associations to press for changes in the practices of the caste system, giving up outmoded customs to adjust to the new opportunities available under colonial rule. Among the lower castes, too, 
the petty bourgeois sections mobilized caste associations to give up occupations that were considered as defiling or degrading, and start emulating the customs of the higher castes in an attempt to get a higher status. The conservative trend among the non-Brahmin movement was strong among these caste associations of the upper sections. The movements among the Patidars in Gujarat and the Rajputs and the Marathas, led by Shahu Maharaj in western Maharashtra, emphasized the process of Sanskritization and were conservative in their orientation. These attempts were led by the landlord and trading elite sections of these castes and helped them to gain access to positions of power and privilege in the state structure and in electoral politics. At the same time, the masses of non-Brahmins were in contradiction with the feudal elite and moneylenders, the social props of the colonial rule, most of whom were from the uppermost castes, especially Brahmins in many parts of Western and South India. Members of these feudal upper castes also monopolized the state bureaucracy. These contradictions led to the emergence of a non-Brahmin movement in Maharashtra and South India, especially Tamil Nadu. The movement, objectively, had an anti-feudal and anti-imperialist content, but the leadership of the movement could not comprehend the contradictions in this manner and therefore failed to articulate them in this manner. The Non-Brahmin Movement The non-Brahmin movement developed in the early period of the 20th century by mobilizing the Shudra middle castes, as well as, to some extent, amongst the untouchable castes against Brahminical feudal domination and exploitation. They concentrated primarily on various aspects of caste oppression, superstition, caste feudal privileges and rights, hereditary nature of posts, etc. The movement used the racial theory of the origins of caste to explain caste oppression, by interpreting Brahmins as Aryan invaders who conquered the Dravidian race. The conservative trend within the movement tended to restrict itself to opposing the monopoly of Brahmins in the field of education and government employment, in the legislatures, and the struggle to get representation in the legislatures and control on district boards. The Justice Party, Non-Brahmin Party, the Unionist Party, Punjab, marked this trend. The Triveni Sangh in Bihar also restricted itself to the three main middle castes, the Yadavs, the Kurmis, and the Koeris. This trend was not sympathetic to the oppression and needs of the lowest castes. The radical sections of the non-Brahmin movement were more broad-based, more thorough in their anti-caste stand, rejecting the whole caste system with its hierarchy and oppression. They took up the questions of the peasantry and of the middle castes as well. The leadership of the non-Brahmin movement aroused the democratic consciousness of the oppressed masses and prepared the ground for their mobilization into the anti-imperialist movement. But the classes in the leadership, having gained their demands for representation and a share in the decision-making, gave up their anti-caste program. These movements place political power in the hands of the upper sections of the non-Brahmin castes, the smaller landlords and big tenants when the land reforms were implemented by the Nehru government in the 1950s. Hence, these sections emerged in the post-1947 period as the main oppressors of the poor and landless peasants, most of whom are from the lowest castes. The Marathas in Maharashtra, Reddis in Kamas in Andhra Pradesh, the Vokaligas and Lingayats in Karnataka, Patels, Patidars in Gujarat, and the Yadevs and the Jats in Bihar and Haranya, respectively. The class interests of the leadership of these movements prevented them from taking up a thorough anti-caste program, which should have included the land question from the viewpoint of the lowest castes, the poor and the landless. And thus, they consolidated their own position, but betrayed the interests of the middle and poor peasants of their castes. The non-Brahmin movement was strongest in Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, and threw up important leaders like Periyar and Jyoti Bapule. Non-Brahmin Movement in Maharashtra The movement began with the founding of the Satya Shodak Samaj SS in Pune. The rise of the SS took place in the context of a rise of Brahminical Hindu revivalism in western India in the 1870s, with its base in Pune, which put the upper caste reformers on the defensive. 
After working as a social reformer for almost 20 years, Jyotiba Pule founded the SS in 1873 in Pune. The main task of the SS was to make the non-Brahmins conscious of their exploitation by the Brahmins. Pule himself belonged to the Mali gardener caste, a caste involved in the cultivation of vegetables and their trade in the vicinity of Pune. His family was middle class and he was educated in a mission school. The SS did not restrict its activities to any particular caste and worked among the various non-Brahmin and B castes of the rural areas of Tane, Pune, and later in other districts in Bombay province and Berar. They also worked among the workers in the textile mills of Bombay. The songs, booklets, and plays written by Pule used a popular, hard-hitting style and language to expose the various ways in which the Brahmins duped the people, especially the peasants. The SS interpreted the racial theory of the origin of caste in the context of popular tradition. The Aryan invaders had enslaved the local peasantry, the rule of Bali Raja, the peasant king, was defeated, showing the links of the SS with the democratic sentiments of the peasantry. In Pule's time, the SS campaigned for social reform. They rejected their own feudal-style marriages and adopted the SS marriages, which were based on principles of equality, mutual respect, and loyalty between husband and wife. The SS reform campaign in Pule's time led to a strike by barbers who decided not to tonsure widows leading to tensions in the village. Pule ran a paper called Din Bandu, Friend of the Oppressed. His main supporters were Telugu contractors and workers in the textile mills, the first reformist organization among the textile workers of Bombay, the Mill Hands Association, was formed in 1890 by N. M. Lokande under Pule's guidance. This association represented the grievances of the mill workers till it was pushed aside by the militant trade unions that emerged among the workers in the aftermath of the First World War. Pule promoted modern agriculture among the peasantry and personally bought land to experiment and set an example before them. He was influenced by the democratic American writings of Tom Paine and the principles of liberty and equality. He wrongly believed that British rule had destroyed the rule of Brahmins and brought modern education to all castes, and hence was a supporter of the colonial rule in the country. The Non-Brahmin Movement After Pule After Pule's death, the activists of the SS continued to work. The fact that units of the SS were formed in villages, not only in the districts like Ahmed Nagar, Satara, Kolhapur, but also in the Barad region in Amravati, shows that the growing peasant consciousness was being mobilized through the SS in the beginning of the 20th century. Their propaganda struck a chord among the peasantry. Campaigns against social problems like drinking and against untouchability were taken up. The SS also took up the problems of the peasants, promoting cooperatives among them. The contradictions in the rural areas were expressed by the SS as a conflict between the Shetji, Bachi, and the Bahujan Samaj, moneylender slash priest, and the masses. The SS functioned systematically, holding annual conferences after 1910 and bringing out a magazine. SS Tamashas dramas toured the villages, singing songs and putting up performances to spread their message. The basic content of the activities was anti-feudal. The propaganda of an SS Tamasha led to a spontaneous revolt of the peasants against Brahmin landlords in 1919 in Satara. The peasants were demanding a reduction in the rent. They broke idols and abused the gods and the wives of the Brahmins. This revolt was not supported by the landlord sections of the NBs in the rural areas. Nonetheless, SS activity continued, and SS activists were involved in peasant agitations in other districts in the 1920s. The SS attacked the feudal authority in rural areas and aroused the democratic consciousness of the peasants. The SS campaigns led to the exodus of Brahmin landlords from the villages in western Maharashtra. It laid the ground for the militant anti-imperialist struggles led by the peasantry in the region in the 1940s, like the Patrisarkar movement in Satara, when a parallel authority was set up against the British. The interests of the feudal and rich peasant sections of the NBs could not be satisfied within the SS, nor could they support the populist and militant propaganda. 
In 1915, the non-Brahmin party was formed in order to contest district board elections and enter the legislature. This trend was closely allied with the colonial government and the textile mill owners in Bombay, and was strongly anti-Tilak and anti-Congress. The NB party was very active in Pune in the 1920s, in a long drawdown and bitter battle with the Congress extremists like Tilak and his supporters. Another conservative trend associated with the MB party was the group led by Shahu Maharaj, the ruler of the Kolhapur Principality. The Maharaj supported education for the lower castes, setting up hostels for them. But the main thrust of his activities was gaining Kshatriya status and forming a priesthood parallel to Brahmins. He was attracted to the Arya Samaj later. While Pule and the later SS activity supported colonial rule, their main activity was arousing mass consciousness about social and cultural oppression. However, the NB party was collaborationist from the beginning and failed to express the mass sentiment aroused to direct anti-imperialist consciousness. Hence, a large section of the NB party joined the Congress in the 1930s, while a much smaller group led by Javalkar joined the CPI. The dominant sections of the NB movement consolidated the interests of the narrow sections of the non-Brahmins, the landlords, and developed a hegemonic Maratha consciousness within the Congress. They betrayed the interests of the other middle and lower castes in the anti-caste tasks. They suppressed the entire Shatya Shodak tradition. This tradition was kept alive by middle peasant-based parties that emerged in the region in the 1940s, like the Peasants and Workers Party and the Lal Nishan Party, as well as the Dalit movement. The SS movement was the main movement in the early part of this century in Maharashtra through which the anti-feudal, anti-caste sentiments of the peasant masses of the middle castes were expressed. It dealt a blow to Brahminical hegemony and feudal relations in the countryside. But since the leadership of the movement restricted their attack to caste ideology and failed to put forward a program to break the foundations of the caste system and the concentration of land, the main means of production, they could only reform the caste system in feudalism and not break it. Hence, they were unable to fulfill the interests of the lower castes. The Non-Brahmin Movement in Tamil Nadu The concentration of religious and economic power in the hands of the Brahmin castes in the erstwhile Madras presidency, the concentration of Brahmins in the modern fields, education and bureaucracy in the province, the emergence of petty bourgeois and nascent bourgeois classes among the lower classes, including an educated intelligentsia, led to the emergence of the NB movement in Tamil Nadu. While the first stirrings of the movement began by the mid-19th century itself, a movement against the domination of the higher castes started by the end of the century and gained organized expression by the 1920s. The fact that the Brahmins, as the largest section of the intelligentsia, were the first to become active in the leadership of the Congress and in the Home Rule League that was founded by Annie Besant and Captain Olcott, added to the separation of the NB movement and the anti-imperialist movement from the early days. It led to the view being put forward that unless caste differences were eliminated, India's political development would not be possible. The social reform movement in the form of the Madras Hindu Social Reform Association, 1892, which was active in promoting the education of women, reform of marriage, abolition of untouchability, involved a wide cross-section of the intelligentsia. The violent conflicts between the low-caste Tadi Tapper Nadars, after they had risen economically through trade, and the feudal Marwaris, in the vicinity of Sivakasi in 1899, after the unsuccessful attempt of the town of Nadars to enter a temple, reveals that with social differentiation, the lower castes were astir for their democratic rights, against traditional inequalities in hierarchy. This movement led, on the one hand, to the formation of the Justice Party, which primarily sought and obtained representation in the legislatures through communal electorates and used patronage for gaining posts in the bureaucracy. It was strongly pro-British. On the other hand, the much more mass-based and radical self-respect movement, led by E. V. Ramaswamy, EVR, or Periyar, did not restrict itself to promoting the interests of the NBs in the administration, but went further and launched an all-round attack on the caste system and Brahminical Hinduism. While Periyar often used the platform of the Justice Party, 
his movement was mass-based and iconoclastic. The Justice Party was led by, and clearly represented, the interests of big landlords and merchants from among the upper castes among the non-Brahmins only. Petiyar's movement was based on wider support of the rising working class, the middle class, and the traders, especially in the urban centers like Erode, Madurai, Coimbatore, Salem, Tiruchirapalli, Tuticorn, and other towns. At its peak, the self-respect movement took up the activities of propagating against moneylenders' exploitation and the problems of the peasantry. The Justice Party was formed in 1917 in response to the political reforms being proposed by the British government. It campaigned in India and in England for separate representation to the non-Brahmins in Madras Presidency. It won the elections in 1920 and formed the Provincial Ministry in Madras Presidency. In 1923, its base had eroded, but it managed to continue in the government. But in 1926, it lost badly to the Swarajis. The Justice Party, in office, showed itself against the interests of the untouchables and working class. Hence, its base was easily eroded. While the Justice Party took a strong pro-British stand, anti-colonial intellectuals among the non-Brahmins, many of whom were active within the Congress, for instance, Kesava Pillay, EVR, Dr. Vada Dara Jalu, formed the Madras Presidency Association in 1917 to press for full communal representation for the NBs. E. V. Ramaswamy formed the self-respect movement after he walked out of the Congress in 1925 for their unwillingness to support separate representation for the NBs. The conservative, pro-feudal, pro-Vardhana positions of the Congress leadership had led to tensions within the Congress between Brahmins and NBs. EVR's movement was concentrated in the Tamil areas of the presidency. It was oriented towards the oppressed castes, including the untouchables, and took active steps to involve women and the youth. They ran a magazine called Kudiyarasu. Militant attacks with an atheistic approach were launched by the self-respect movement, not only on Brahmins, but also on the religion itself, on superstition, caste divisions, and caste privileges. EVR wanted to arouse the self-respect and feeling of equality among the lower castes. They upheld the pride in Tamil language and opposed the use of Sanskrit. They propagated a ban on the use of Brahmin priests for marriages and popularized self-respect marriages. They opposed the use of Thali, called for the abolition of caste names, and ridiculed the epics, like the Ramayana. EVR's style was direct, propagandist, and very popular. By struggling for the equality of all castes and breaking the hold of religion, the movement paved the way for a materialist analysis. In the 1930s, the self-respect movement, under the influence of communists in Tamil Nadu and the influence of Periyar's trip to the USSR, supported socialism. Communists like Singaro Velu propagated materialist philosophy and socialism through the magazine. During that period, two trends were active within the self-respect movement, one which preferred to restrict itself to social reform, and the other which wanted to take up anti-capitalist propaganda and activity. The self-respect socialists began organizing on problems of the peasantry along with their regular conferences. Under the influence of the CPI leaders, the self-respect socialists, the Samadharma group, merged into the Congress Socialist Party in November 1936. Petiyar faced repression from the British government for his attack on the NB government and for promoting Soviet Bolshevism. Consequently, Petiyar retracted. The self-respect movement could not sustain its social radicalism consistently and was unable to give expression to the sentiments of the masses demanding a full attack on feudal land relations. Petiyar then entered the Justice Party and in 1942 formed the Dravida Iyakam, DK. They supported the efforts of the British in the war. In 1947, during the transfer of power, Petiyar called for August 15th to be observed as a day of mourning, demanding freedom from the Brahmin Raj that had been inaugurated. Differences within his organization on this call, as well as on Petiyar's organizational methods and morality, led to a split with C. Anadore forming the DMK. During Congress rule under Rajagopalachari, the DK launched strong agitations against the decision to impose Hindi. 
the anti-Hindi agitations took place in 1948 and in 1952, and again in 1965, thus giving expression to the Tamil nationality sentiments against the domination of the All India Comprador bourgeoisie. These agitations were violently suppressed. The DK also continued its anti-caste propaganda, breaking the images of Lord Ganesh, calling for a boycott of temples, burning thousands of copies of the Constitution in 1957 for maintaining the caste system. The NB movement continued in the 1950s as a cultural expression of the oppressed castes and the Tamil nationality. Pettyar supported the Congress when Anandar Kamaraj became the chief minister. Later, he supported the DMK government. The DMK and the AAI-DMK, the parties formed from within Tamil Nadu, represented the interests of the regional comprador sections with whom the self-respect movement had compromised. It also compromised with Brahmanism and with the policies of the All India Comprador Bourgeoisie. While initially in the 1950s they gave expression to the Tamil nationalist sentiments and propagated against casteism, ever since they achieved power at the state level, they consolidated the class interests of the landlord sections of the middle castes and the regional comprador bourgeoisie. Hence, these parties have not been sympathetic to the demands of the lowest castes and have been equal to the Congress in the suppression of the militant and revolutionary agitations of the lowest sections of society. In order to further their class interests, they have come to an agreement with the All India Comprador Bourgeoisie and sacrificed the interests of the Tamil nationality as well. Thus, a section has even supported the repression of the struggle of the Tamils in Sri Lanka.